Today's eternal good news is found in Matthew 18, verse 19. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. Now that's eternal good news you can count on. From Matthew 18, verse 19. Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. Have your Bibles open at Romans chapter 10. Direct us, our Father, as we open thy word to study today. I pray that souls will be enlightened and born of thy Spirit. Souls, our Father, that are religious but lost, professors of religion but not possessors of salvation, save every poor lost soul listening to the gospel hour today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are studying the doctrine of salvation as recorded in the word of God, not as recorded by religion or man, but in the Bible. Now, I gave Psalm 3.8, Jonah 2.9 as a text. The psalmist declares, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Jonah adds, Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. Now I ask two questions. Luke 10, the Pharisee, the lawyer, asked Jesus, What shall I do to inherit eternal life. The jailer, about to take his own life, asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? The lawyer, what shall I do to inherit? The jailer, what shall I do to be saved? Now, we're talking about salvation, and if we get what the law would give us, it's death, because the wages of sin is death, and sin is transgressing God's law. Now, I said the word salvation is used 44 times in the New Testament, and we are studying the verses where the word salvation is used. Now, to save time, I will not review today, but I will read the last verse that we read on the last broadcast in this series, then we'll move on. It is my favorite. That is, the two verses are my favorite verses in the New Testament. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be S-A-V-E-D, saved. Now here's the word, here's where the word salvation is used. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, salvation is confessed with the mouth when man believes in his heart. And heart belief is trust. And trust is faith. And faith brings saving grace. And grace brings salvation. The grace of God that bringeth salvation. We'll read that verse later. Now let me say this before we go further. The word salvation is used five times in Luke, one time in John, five times in Acts, and four times in Romans. Now we're going to study the third mention of salvation in Romans, and it's in chapter 11 and verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Now Paul is talking about Israel, his own people. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Now watch this. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. 
You remember in Acts, when we were studying the word salvation, I read Acts 28, 28. That's the last chapter of Acts and verse 28. Paul gives the message to the Jews in Rome, and he tells them that God sent to them their Messiah, their Savior, and they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They refused to believe, they refused to hear, they refused to see, and God turned to the Gentiles. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Now, Paul, writing to the Romans here, declares that through the fall of the nation, that is the Israelites, the Jews, salvation is come to the Gentiles to provoke the nation Israel to jealousy. Beloved, Jesus came to the Jew first. In Romans 1.16, I read the gospel, the power of God, to the Jew first, to the Gentile, the Jew, the Greek, but to the Jew first. Jesus came to his people the apple of God's eye, the wife of Jehovah. In the Old Testament, the nation is referred to as the wife of Jehovah, the apple of God's eye, and God's peculiar people, God's elect nation. Jesus came to the Jew, and Pilate said, What shall I do with Jesus? They said, Crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. We will not have this man to reign over us. So, Jesus turned to the Gentiles. And, thank God, Paul was called and ordained a minister. Well, the apostle. In verse 13 of chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 13, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. So God, on the road to Damascus, that is, he convicted Paul, Saul, of course, and he was converted and he was baptized, and he was sent to the Gentiles to declare unto them the light of the glorious gospel. Now, the next mention of salvation in Romans is in chapter 13 and verse 4. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now, salvation, let me say this, and I hope you'll bear with me just a moment, because if you don't listen carefully, you may misunderstand. Salvation is progressive. Now, wait a minute. We're not redeemed progressively. We are redeemed instantaneously. But salvation is progressive. Many great Bible scholars have declared that it is past tense, present tense, and future tense. That is, we are saved from the penalty of sin when we believe. We are saved from the power of sin day by day. And in the sweet by and by, we'll be saved from the presence of sin. Now, the spirit is saved now, but the body will be saved. Now, wait. The body will be made like unto his glorious body in the first resurrection. So Paul is not speaking here of the redemption of the Spirit, but the salvation of, uh, that is, God's salvation in its completeness. Body, soul, spirit, that is, when we will see Jesus and be like him. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. And it's most interesting to notice that in the second letter to the Corinthian church, and we're turning there now, in chapter 1 and verse 6, we have the first mention, let me read it, and it's mentioned two times, by the way, in this verse. And whether we be afflicted, this is 2 Corinthians 1, 6. 2 Corinthians 1, 6. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and and salvation. Now, you know, I, I'm telling you the honest truth when I say this. I have, I do not have any notes. Now, I study and I make notes. And I have notes on the message that I'm bringing right now, but I do not have them before me. All I have is a Schofield Testament in my hand, a hardback Schofield Testament. That's all I have. Now, I'm saying that to assure you that I did not plan to say what I'm going to say. 
But it hasn't been too long ago that I was talking to a dear friend of mine. And he said, Preacher, I could not understand why you have suffered physically so much in the past six or eight years. I've had surgery six times. I've been at death's door more than one time. And I mean down at the door. I mean at the door, just as near. Anybody can ever come to dying and live. Now, the reason I'm alive, God's people prayed, and God heard your prayers. Now, I I don't I seldom give a personal, uh, an illustration having to do with my personal life and, and testimony, but I, I feel that this will help somebody. Now, you say, Brother Green, what does that mean now? Whether we be afflicted, Paul is writing, and he's the apostle to the Gentiles, he led the Corinthians to Christ and established a church there. And he said, whether we be afflicted, he's talking about himself, or, or Paul and Silas and his helpers, it is for your consolation and salvation. Now, does, does that mean that they could be saved through Paul's affliction? No, 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 no. And I suppose Paul suffered as no man except Jesus. I don't think any mortal ever suffered any more, and I don't think as much as Paul. And when it comes to suffering, I don't know the meaning of the word as compared to Paul. I don't even know the meaning of the word suffer. I know nothing about suffering. But I have had some serious physical sickness in the past eight or ten years, six, eight years, nine. I don't know just how many years it's been, but I've had surgery six times. And I've been in the hospital eight times. And I could go on and tell you a lot about it, but I'm not. Now, here's what I was going to tell you. This dear friend of mine, one of the dearest friends I have, he said, I, can't un I couldn't understand until I was talking to a person about your physical condition and the malignant tumor that you had removed in January of 1970. And he said, I was talking to this gentleman, and this man said, I couldn't understand why a man that seems to be as faithful in the ministry, as Brother Green would have to suffer so much until he said one of my neighbors was saved by the radio the morning they announced that Brother Green had a malignant tumor. Now, you see, now let me tell you something. Let me tell you something now. God has not put one thing on me that I do not deserve. And if I had what I deserve, I'd be in hell begging for water. Now, that's right. I'm saved by grace, I'm kept by grace, I'm sustained by the power and the grace of God. But I'm trying to get across a point. We, uh, Paul is not saying that these Corinthians are saved through his suffering, but as the result of his suffering for Christ's sake and his testimony, even in the hour of suffering, you know, when he knew that he had, he said, my death is imminent, my death is imminent. But he said, I, I fought a good fight. Now, he said, Timothy, you, you do the work of an evangelist. Now, in other words, he's saying, if I had the opportunity, I'd live just like I've lived, except he'd live better, of course. But he means, I would still be an evangelist. I'd still go to prison. I would still die for my testimony. Because when Paul said to Timothy, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. He said, my departure is at hand. Now, that's that word, that Greek word at hand is imminent. In other words, they're coming for me any minute, any minute now, they'll come and get me and chop my head off. But he wasn't discouraged. He wasn't talking about a casket in the graveyard. No, no, he was admonishing his son in the ministry, in the faith, of course, his son in the faith, in the ministry. He was not despondent. He was not depressed. Now, I'll admit that I have been... I have been tempted through depression, and I, I prayed, and I've asked you to pray that, that I wouldn't get depressed. But let me say this. I am so thankful to be alive today, and I am so thankful not to be paralyzed on my left side. Blood vessel collapsed in my brain, and I'm numb and on one side, but I'm not paralyzed, and I have perfect use. I say perfect use. I have almost perfect use of my leg and my arm and and my body. I, I, I'm so grateful and so thankful that I can preach on the radio until I have ceased to worry 
about and fret about not being in revival meetings. Now, I'd love to go back to the tent. I don't suppose I ever will. I'd love to go back to church revivals. I doubt if I'll ever do church revivals. I don't know. I may, but I, I just can't say about that as God wills. But this man said, the morning they announced that Brother Green had a malignant tumor, I said, well, and I got down on my knees and wept and prayed and called on God. And then this good friend of mine said that now I understand that all things work together for good. Even though it may look like a tragedy, even though it may seem tragic, it is for our good and God's glory and the, the glory of God's kingdom, whatever God permits and whatever God allows. So Paul to come upon us, of course, as believers, as born-again believers. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation. Now, you'll be consoled when you suffer, because you're going to suffer. Paul said, if you live godly, you'll suffer. Now, you read that in 2 Timothy 3.12. You read that. If you live godly, you'll suffer. All that live godly will suffer. So he said, my suffering and my affliction is for your consolation, your salvation. People will be saved because of it. Not, not that the affliction saves them, but they are, they are convicted and they're caused to think. Somebody wrote me a letter and said, Brother Green, I don't see how you go on. I don't see why you don't quit. Now, I just mark that down to ignorance. That's right. I mean it. I, I, I say that in love. I, I don't want to be ugly. But anybody that would write me and say, Brother Green, because of your hospital experiences and sickness and suffering, I don't see how you go on. If God can't do any better than that toward you, you've prayed and asked God to give you strength and heal you. And, and uh, I've had some pretty strong letters from some people about my faith. Now, I tell you, I have faith in God that he has saved me, called me to preach, and I have faith in God that he won't let anything happen to me that's not according to God's will and plan and for my good and God's glory. So come what may, come what may, don't you worry about me. Just pray for me. Yeah, don't worry about me because I'm not worried and I'm not going to fret. And this person said, "If I don't see why you don't quit. I don't see why you don't quit. Well, listen, I. you want to know why I don't quit? Jesus didn't quit. He marched to Calvary. They nailed him to a cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God has never forsaken me. I've never gone through the dark hours without the knowledge of his presence. God has always been by my side. Now, Jesus cried out, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus took my place. That's why God forsook him in that dark hour when he bare the sin and the sins of the world and nailed them to his cross. Now, Paul said, because of my affliction, you're consoled and folks will be saved, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Glory to God. Two times it's mentioned there. Now, in the, and this is the last one that I'll read today. In the, the uh, same book in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, or he saith, I have heard thee in the time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And we'll talk about that on the next broadcast. Now is the day of salvation. But I wanted to read it in this closing moment. This is the accepted time. This is the day of salvation. Now is the time. This is the moment. And a minute from now, five minutes from now, may be too late for you, whoever you are without God listening to my voice now. Today's the day and now's the time. And if you're not born again, I pray that you'll give your heart to Jesus right now. Father, in Jesus' precious name, honor thy precious word and save every soul that's under conviction. Save especially poor, lost church members who united with the church been baptized in water, but they've never been washed in the blood. Save them by thy grace. We ask it to the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Write to us at the Gospel Hour, Post Office Box 2024, that's 2024, Greenville, South Carolina, 29602. 
or call us toll-free Monday through Friday between the hours of 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time at 1-800-745-0324. To receive an audio cassette or CD of today's message, be sure to give us today's date and enclose a gift of at least $5 